Well, good morning and Merry Christmas. Oh, I'm sorry, just the, the whiteout snowstorm confused me. Happy Easter and welcome to the service of worship. We welcome you whether you are listening by KDCR radio or live stream on the internet from our webpage or Facebook. We welcome you to the service on this Easter Sunday morning. And as we welcome you, we gather with Christians around the world and across the ages and we celebrate that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And my friends, we have been saying that through pandemics and through snowstorms. We've been saying that through the millennia because those words are true and all other realities of this world are submitted to the reality that Christ died for us, that he rose for us, that the tomb is empty, and that even now the spirit is at work in the world. And with that hope before us, we gather on this Easter Sunday, even in this different way. We want to again invite you to an embodied worship as we sing songs, many of them familiar Easter hymns. If you're able, please stand and sing with us this morning. We also want to encourage you, if you have prayer requests, again, to send those to my cell number, 712-441-5871. Whoever you are, we'd like to pray for you this morning when we get to that portion of our service. One other announcement this, e this morning, we celebrated Good Friday together, we celebrate Easter morning together, then tonight we're going to do something as a congregation at Bethel, if you're a member here. We're going to have a trivia night, and so there is information in the bulletin if you didn't receive that from Wanda, you can go to our website, click on the bulletin link, and then the Easter bulletin, there's information about how to join for an online trivia night tonight as we celebrate the gift we have as a family of faith. And with those things before us today, we're going to open the service in prayer, and that prayer is going to go right into a song. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, even as the winds howl around, and even as this world reminds us in different ways every day, that we are longing for a savior. Father, we thank you that you have given us a savior, that you sent your son born in a manger, who lived a perfect life, who died for our sin on the cross, and who three days later rose victorious from the grave. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would enable us by your Holy Spirit this morning to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and even now is seated at your right hand, interceding for us. Father, may we look up and see him on the cross. May we look up and see him rising from the dead. And may we look up and wait for the day when he will come again to make all things new. Father, we pray this, asking for your spirit's presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, my Lord. 
friends, he is coming and he is here. And in that assurance, I invite you if you're able to please stand for our call to worship. The call to worship comes to us this morning from the book of Isaiah, prophecy from chapter 25. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine and the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace from his people, from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Friends, let us be, rejoice and be glad in that salvation, singing together, Christ the Lord is risen today. risen Lord is the one who greets us with these words. The grace of Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship this Easter Sunday of the Holy Spirit be with each of you now and forevermore. Amen. And brothers and sisters, on an Easter Sunday, if you're blessed to be with others who are around you, I invite you to join them and greet them with traditional greeting, Christ is risen, and the response, he's risen indeed. Friends, let's continue in worship, singing together now another old Easter hymn, Lo, in the grave Christ lay. from 
Friends, Christ arose, but if you've been standing, you may be seated. Today, as we reflect on our lives on an Easter Sunday, God invites us to a time of confession, a time to step into the light, and we are invited to that through the words, a call to confession from Ephesians 5. Everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. That is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Let's ask that God would shine his light in our lives now in a prayer of confession. Would you please pray with me? Almighty God, we ask for that light to shine on our lives, on our souls, on our very being. And Father, as we step into the light, we confess that apart from the work of your spirit, we are dead in our sins. We confess that again and again this week, our hearts have been drawn back to the ways that lead to death. We have followed our sins down pathways of pride and gluttony, of lust and of greed, of envy and anger, and a slowness of heart to love our neighbor and to love you. Father, we have acted in ways that have reminded us that the wages of sin indeed is death. And so we pray on this Easter Sunday as we step into the light that you would once again raise us from the dead, that you would once again by your Holy Spirit set us apart that you would once again bring the life of the resurrected Christ to bear in every dimension of our being and of our lives and of our relationships. Heavenly Father, we pray this in the sure hope of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Friends, as we pray a prayer of confession, we hear God's words of assurance from 1 Corinthians 15. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, let's celebrate that victory singing together, Christ is risen. Oh, hell, 
friends, as we turn to the gospel story this morning, we first will hear a video children's message. So again, if you're a parent with young children, if you're welcome to call them back for our video children's message this Sunday. and girls, this is Pastor John reporting with the Good News Network. In a world with so much bad news, today we're going to try to find what are some things that are good news. Our first story, even though people are now watching services at home, they've still found ways to make it feel normal by finding back rows to sit in. And another piece of good news, cats don't actually have nine lives. In other good news, researchers in Ames, Iowa have discovered a miraculous material that stops the spread of COVID-19 when used as a face mask. Apparently, the crimson and gold is something that the virus can't stand getting near. In other good news, other scientists have found something that may be a match for the coronavirus. We'll have to wait 14 days to see. And still more good news, despite the fact that there's a winter storm on Easter Sunday in Northwest Iowa, 97% of climatologists say the world is getting warmer. And now for further good news, we go to our news correspondent, the Good Shepherd Smith, on location. Hello, this is Good Shepherd Smith, reporting with Fox News. I'm here with Mary, who claims to have experienced some good news this morning. Mary, what can you tell us? Well, I was on my way to the tomb early this morning, and all of a sudden, there was an earthquake. And the soldiers shook and became like dead men. Wow, that's good news. Then I got to the tomb, and the stone was rolled away. Wow, that is good news. What happened then? I looked inside and it was empty. Wow, that is good news. Then an angel appeared to me. He said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Go and tell his disciples the good news. Wow, that's a lot of good news. Thanks, Mary. Back to you, John. Thanks, Good Shepherd Smith. That's not just some good news. That is the good news. And boys and girls, we are today studying where Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And the good news is, because the tomb is empty, sin is destroyed, Satan is defeated, death is no more. In fact, one day all that is sad will be untrue, and all good things will never come to an end. Because Jesus said, because he's risen from the dead, there will be no more death, nor mourning, nor crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away, and he is making everything new. My friends, that is the good news. This is Pastor John. Have a good day. So friends, I invite you to turn with me to hear that good news. We're going to be briefly in John chapter 11, verses 25 through 26 today, and then we're going to be in John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. If you're a guest with us in the Lenten season, the season preparing ourselves for Easter, we've been in the Gospel of John, beginning in chapter 1, and we've been looking at who Jesus is as he reveals himself, and also who we are in him. So it began in chapter 1 when Jesus first appeared in the scene, and we were told he is the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. On Good Friday, we finished with his death where his last words were, I am thirsty and it is finished. That redemptive work of the Lamb is completed. And in between those two things, Jesus has been revealing himself as the I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine. Now today we're going to hear an I am spoken by Jesus at a friend's graveside. And then we're going to be witness to the I am by his own graveside. And our goal again is to understand, even in this Easter Sunday, who Jesus is. With that before us, would you please pray with me? 
Heavenly Father, this morning feels so different. And yet we thank you that your gospel is good news not simply on easy days, not on normal days, but it is good news especially in days that are dark and stormy, when so many things that we took for granted have been taken away. Heavenly Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be once again moving among your people, that wherever we are listening to these words from your scriptures, whether in our cars, in our homes with others, or alone, wherever we are, we thank you, Lord, that you are with us. We know this is true because the tomb is empty, and Christ is seated at the right hand of you, our Father, and his Spirit is among us now. So, Father, speak, for your children are listening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read John chapter 11, beginning at verse 25 and 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then going to John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary of Magdala went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Don't hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Mary of Magdala went to the disciples with the news. I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, let's begin today by just acknowledging that these are not normal days. That so many things right now seem turned upside down. For example, relationships between parents and children. I I saw this posting. I am in an an unsettling reversal of my teenage years. I am now yelling at my parents for going out. It's not just those things that are turned upside down. Now it's not the dogs. It's the dog's owners needing to wear a collar not to touch their face. We also have unique physical needs like this young man holding a cardboard sign will work for toilet paper. Even human relationships are different. I've seen some new pickup lines for those who are single. One of them says this, If COVID-19 doesn't take you out, can I? Another one, You can't spell virus without you and I. Or, baby, do you need toilet paper? Because I can be your Prince Charming. There's even unique challenges for those who are married. Like this poor husband who said, I told my wife how thankful I was to have someone I enjoyed being quarantined with. She said, must be nice. These are not normal days. And this is not a normal Easter. 
Normally on Easter, we plan on a beautiful spring day, and now it's a winter storm in northwest Iowa. Normally Easter is marked by packed churches and huge crowds, and the church is empty. Normally Easter is marked by a spectacle with great trumpeters, trained musicians playing, and now all you have is a pastor with a harmonica. It's kind of a letdown. Easter is supposed to be gathering with family for a large meal, and instead we are socially distancing. These aren't normal days. This isn't a normal Easter. But the good news is that the first Easter wasn't a normal Easter either. In fact, in the first Easter, the disciples were gathered, there's the camera, the disciples were gathered not in their normal ways. And in fact, as we read the account in John, what we see is that the Easter story begins not with crowds, but a woman alone in the dark. It continues with doubt and fear and tears. And it ends with the disciples at the end of Easter, self-quarantined, sheltering in place with the doors locked, hiding from the world in the room. This is not a normal Easter but perhaps it is, for the first time in our life, the most authentic Easter. And to understand that, we need to understand Jesus' first words from the tomb. Now, the setting in John chapter 20 is a setting that is a little bit more muted than the other Gospels. Rather than there being the bright sunshine of dawn, John begins his Easter story in the dark. Notice verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark. And rather than beginning with a group of women and a company of soldiers, John begins with just one solitary woman in the dark. Notice, go on in verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Now, she is not just simply alone in that moment in John's telling. But she has spent her life alone, and there's an interesting clue to that. Earlier at the foot of the cross, Mary was also there, and there were other women there. But notice how they are described in comparison to her. Chapter 19. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Now one of those women is described by being a mother, another by being a sister, another by being a wife, and then... Mary is simply described as being from a place, like she has no other human connection, like she is socially distanced. And then John also not only begins in the dark and with a solitary individual, but the other Gospels have more things that are spectacular, clothes that shine like lightning and earthquakes. Not in John's Gospel. It's more like the low drama of a junior high track meet. Mary sees an empty tomb. She runs and tells two disciples. They run. They see an empty tomb. They return. Mary stays. And so we join Mary again, a solitary woman alone in the dark. And if we listen this Easter Sunday morning, what we hear is the sound of crying. In chapter 20, verse 11, this is what we read. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying as she wept, she bent over to look in the tomb. Now the word in Greek for crying is not glistening eyes and small sobs. This is the word of deep abiding grief. Of water pouring from the eyes and snot pouring from the nose and guttural cries pouring from the soul. She is crying so much that as she looks back in the tomb for a second time, now it's not empty. There are angels. The first and only time in John's gospel that there are angels. But she's not even afraid of them. And they say to her, why are you crying? And she mumbles her reply. And then she turns around, and finally she sees Jesus. But she doesn't recognize him, maybe because of the tears of her eyes, or the shadows of early morning, or simply unbelief. And then Jesus says his first words to her. Woman, why are you crying? Now the question is, how do we hear those words today? And I think for many of us, we hear those words in light of Luke's gospel where the angels say, why do you look for the living among the dead? In other words, don't be looking here. We hear Jesus saying, why are you crying? Don't be crying. Because certainly he's not asking that question because he's probing for information. 
Jesus, like all of us, you don't need to be a prophet to know if someone's by a tomb and they're crying, you don't have to ask why. And Jesus was there on Good Friday, so he doesn't have to ask what just happened. Jesus asked, why are you crying? And it's easy to see because he is rebuking her. One New Testament scholar, D.A. Carson, says this. The question, why are you crying, is not designed to elicit information. It is gentle reproof. By this time, Mary should not have been crying. John Calvin says it a little more forcefully. We need not praise the woman because they remained at the sepulcher. Well, the disciples returned home, for the latter went home comforted and full of joy, whereas the woman indulged themselves in stupid and pointless weeping. Calvin is quite an angel. Why are you crying? Jesus is rebuking the woman. He's saying, don't cry. In other words, in this reading, Jesus is inviting Mary to the first normal Easter. A place free of crying, a place of joy and only victory and celebration. What he's saying to her is, if you understand that I'm the resurrection and the life, then you won't cry anymore. Why are you crying? Stop it. This is the first normal Easter, an Easter of victory and of joy. And the truth is, there are many in our world today who read this story that way and who expect Easter to be celebrated in that way. Just yesterday, I was looking in the news and I saw a fellow pastor, a brother in Christ, Joel Osteen, and the headline was advertising this Easter service. The headline said, Pastor Joel Osteen previews Fox Nation Easter Sunday service. Quote, it's just going to be very uplifting. Joel Osteen went on, the article went on to say this, Easter service with Joel and Victoria Olstein will be streamed live at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time with guest stars Kanye West, Mariah Carey, and Tyler Perry. Quoting Joel Osteen, it's all virtual, but it's just going to be very uplifting couple of hours. I would say when there are guest stars, you hope it is. Spectacular. Joel went on to say, Easter in my life, it reminds me of new beginnings, of freshness, and let's let go of the old Osteen continued, let's tune out some of the negative and things that didn't work out and who hurt us and what we're facing. Let's tune those things out and focus on the joy. Why are you crying, would say Joel. Stop it. This should be a normal Easter. I even have guest stars. And I think many of us today are longing for a normal Easter too. Because if we're honest, as we gather under the cross, we want more than just two Easter lilies. And we want want to hear more than simply two voices. We want to hear a throng of voices. Because we need Easter to be a little island of joy in the sea of our sadness. But the problem is, what about those people who can't join us on that island? This week I received a phone call from my brother. He's a nurse. And he's working in a COVID unit of a hospital in northern Michigan. He is in the acute care working with the COVID patients. And as he spoke to me, his voice was crackling with emotion. He shared that he doesn't have enough equipment, that he has to use the same mask three shifts in a row. But that's not why he was emotional. He was emotional because his patients are dying. And they're dying alone. That even the normal support staff who would clean aren't allowed to come into those rooms. And that the chaplain's not allowed to come in. And that the person's pastor and their families are not allowed to come in. And they're put on ventilators so they can't talk. And the majority of patients put on ventilators will never come off. They will die. And his patients are dying in front of his eyes. And on this Easter Sunday, he's working today. Choking back tears. And my brother is not alone. I read in the New York Post a chaplain in New York City. And this is what she wrote. This has made my job hell. Normally my job is to listen, to confront, to comfort, and to pray for healing. Now my job is to pray for a swift and merciful death for most of my patients. I hold weeping, sweaty-faced nurses through gloves and masks to whom I promise their work is meaningful. The Economist tells of triage and how doctors are learning to do it, including telling of doctors sobbing in the hallways, having chose who will live and who will die. 
And it's not just medical caretakers who experience it. This weekend I saw on Facebook a pastoral colleague of mine posted this. Struggling emotionally as I gear up to preach on Easter Sunday in the face of an outbreak in one of the nursing homes where four staff and 13 residents have tested positive for COVID-19, seven residents are under my pastoral care. According to a headline yesterday, we surpassed Italy for the highest death toll. On Holy Saturday, 2,000 men, women, children died in the United States just yesterday. Over 100,000 deaths in the world. And every one of those deaths, a family. And yet this is Easter. And so we say to every one of those victims and those who care for them, why are you crying? This is Easter. We want a normal Easter. And it's not just bodies that are broken. I read this week a story of a man named John Klein and his wife, Anne. John is 80 years old. They've been married for 45 years. Anne has had Alzheimer's for 17, the last 17. And every day, John would drive to the nursing home and he would sit for a meal with his wife and they would spend the day together. Now he is not allowed in the door. And so on this Easter Sunday, when we long for normalcy, his wife, who is quickly forgetting who he is, is not able to speak to him or eat with him. And we say to John and Anne, why are you crying? We want a normal Easter. And of course, the tragic thing is, even when things turn out well, our lives never go back. I read again this week a uh, writing of a New Testament professor at Portland Seminary. And this professor is writing not theology, he's writing about his life. And what he describes about his life is that his daughter, at one year old, was diagnosed with cancer. And so he found himself as a parent doing what he never dreamed he'd be doing, donning rubber gloves and a mask, and taking down a jar marked biohazard, and every day taking out chemo pills, masked up, smashing them with a spoon, mixing them with apple juice, and spraying the poison in the mouth of his one-year-old daughter. Now, thankfully, she's recovered. That was in 2014. But he's writing this week, and this is what he wrote this week. Even though cancer treatment is over, and I am happy that she is healthy, my heart is broken by cancer and cannot be fixed. Anytime I hear about family medical problems, especially involving children, I start weeping. Water pouring from the eyes, snow pouring from the nose, guttural cries pouring from the soul. Almost automatically, he says, I am suddenly back there again. It is as if I have, been, have a torn heart that can't be mended. Post-2014, when his daughter was cured, I should be all smiles and sunshine, but I now know there is no going back. My heart, the heart is happy, but not whole. It has done battle with death and lives with the scars. Brothers and sisters, we long for normal days and a normal Easter. But if you read the bulletin and you see the prayer request, there are families in this church wondering what normal even looks like anymore and wondering if we can ever go back. So how do we hear Jesus' words to us? Why are you weeping? Well, I think we hear them as a rebuke because we have heard Jesus speak at another graveside. Just a couple of weeks before, in John chapter 11, Jesus goes to the funeral of his friend Lazarus, a person he loves. And when he arrives there, there's a large crowd, we're told, in chapter 19, chapter 11, verse 19, gathered to mourn. And as he walks past the mourning crowd, one of the sisters of the dead man named Martha comes up to him, mourning herself. And Jesus looks at her, and Jesus says something profound. What does he say? Jesus said to her, I am, ego eimi, the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? He asked her a question. Do you believe this? In other words, why are you weeping? If you actually believe that I am the resurrection and the life, that I've defeated physical death and spiritual death, 
that I give you true life before death and eternal life after death. Do you believe this? Why are you weeping? Although he's not rebuking Martha. Because a couple of verses later, he meets Martha and her sister Mary. And this is what we read in that same scene. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled, and Jesus wept. The resurrection in the life with water pouring out of his eyes and snot pouring out of his nose and a guttural cry pouring out of his soul. Jesus, the resurrection and the life, wept with those who wept. And so we see now in the garden when Jesus meets Mary of Magdalene, he doesn't meet her with a rebuke. He could have a declarative statement, I'm alive, but that would have run over her grief. He asks her a question which enables him to enter into the grief. Why are you crying? And in that tender question entering into her grief, he follows up with a second question. And what is the second question? Who is it you are looking for? Jesus asks her, who? Who? And in asking her who she is looking for, he is pointing her to what he's been telling her and the disciples this entire gospel, who he is. And then he answers his own question for Mary. Because he looks at Mary and he says to her, her name. Jesus said to her, Mary. And in that moment, In hearing her name, Mary discovered who she had been looking for. The I am, the ego Amy, who meets us in the storm and reveals himself as God in the storm. The I am, bread of life, who must die so that we live. The light of the world who shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome. The gate for the sheep who has come that we may have life and have it abundantly. But also in calling her name on that Easter Sunday, he reminds her of who she is looking for. John chapter 10. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name. He leads them out. I am the good shepherd. In the garden, Jesus joins weeping Mary is the good shepherd who knows her by name. Reflecting on this, one New Testament scholar says this. In six short syllables, Mariam and Rabboni, and in just about that many seconds, the world becomes a different place. Death once final has met its match. There is a reality, someone more final than death. That is the compact meaning of this meeting. It, if, it really, if it really happened, everything in life takes on a completely new significance. In other words, nothing is normal anymore because of Easter Sunday. What does this mean for us? Well, a couple of weeks ago, a seminary professor emailed me. He was writing an article, and he was asking some of his former students, how are you going to celebrate Easter this year? And I explained to him an email that I was going to be preaching on John chapter 20. And I laid out all the ways that this story is not a normal Easter and that maybe for the first time for us, this is an authentic Easter. Immediately, he sent me back the article he was working on where he had come to the same conclusion. This is what my professor wrote. Perhaps this is a good time to let the Gospels present their understated Easter accounts. Perhaps this is also a moment when we are being forced to be quiet enough to receive this witness properly. We can't gussy things up as we usually do. And maybe that's a good thing. The good news that is the gospel is that those quiet and and those things quiet and dim, even in tear-drenched places of disorientation, seem to be precisely the places the resurrected Jesus most likely pops into or sneaks up onto from behind. Look for him that way this year. He'll show up. He always does. So I talked to my brother, his voice crackling with emotion. He's working today, Easter Sunday. 
And yet as we talked, as we felt the burden of human pain, we also shared the hope of Christ's presence. That the privilege of walking beside the dying on this week is the privilege of walking with them to the one who hung on the cross and said, I am thirsty, it is finished. But also the one whose tomb is open and empty and who is with us the resurrection and the life even in our tears. That fellow pastor struggling with Easter Sunday, he also wrote the text that he is preaching on today. John chapter 11, where Jesus says to mourners, I am the resurrection and the life. I've defeated physical death and spiritual death. I give you true life before death and eternal life after death. The world is not normal because I've changed it. And that man, 80 years old, John Klein, his wife Anne, they won't let him in the doors to eat with his wife. But every day, John stands outside her window. And as he stands outside her window, he sings to her. He sings songs of the faith. He tells this. This is a picture of John singing to his wife. And this is what he says. No matter what happens, there's no reason to give up on love. If she gets to where she doesn't know me, just as Mary didn't recognize Jesus, I will still go see her because I will still know her. Klein said he now spends about 15 minutes a day outside his wife's window singing songs from the 50s and church hymns such as Jesus Loves Me to help her remember. And friends, on this Easter Sunday to help us remember, I want us to hear him singing a portion of those songs. Or I could just sing it myself. When we, you know this verse. When we we go on to sing, when we've been bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise. Friends, this is not a normal time, and this is not a normal Easter. But the good news is that even in our tears, even outside the window, we can sing of amazing grace. And we can sing of days that will come when we will be bright shining as the sun because the tomb is empty. And the one who emptied the tomb says that the days we live through will not be the days of eternity. Jesus says in, John, in, in Revelation, these words, he will wipe every tear, Jesus will, from their eyes. And there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order, the normal order, has passed away. And Jesus says, behold, I am making everything new. Friends, that is not normal. But Jesus is here, and that is the good news. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we gather on this Easter Sunday, in days that are not normal, and an Easter that is not normal. And yet we thank you for this first Easter story. We thank you that in many ways today is one of our most authentic experiences of that first Easter. And a reminder that because the tomb is empty, everything is changed. Heavenly Father, may we celebrate together, even in our tears, the victory Christ has won. Heavenly Father, may we see this morning that death is defeated and that Christ is on the throne. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of us say, amen. Friends, we respond by singing words based on John 20. See, what a morning. Yes.
is risen from the dead. See Mary weeping, where is he laid? As in sorrow she turns from the empty tomb, hears a voice speak. would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we gather before you this Easter Sunday in our separate homes or vehicles, wherever we are congregated, and that we thank you that because the tomb is empty and the Spirit has been sent, that you are with each one of us, that you, the Good Shepherd, know us and call us by name, that you, the Good Shepherd, even in our tears, even though you are the resurrection and the life, join us in those tears. But that you, the victorious one who cried, it is finished from the cross, will also one day wipe every one of those tears away. And what is considered normal in this world will be undone and you will make everything new. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather with believers around the world, even together in this pandemic around the world, saying to one another the truth that Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Father, we thank you that we can say that in this community with one another and with the church of Jesus Christ, our Buen Pastor, Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd. We pray you'd bless that congregation, Pastor Rodrigo and Karina, that they would also, as they gather in these days, experience that you are a God who is with them. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who has been with our members in their need this week. We thank you that John Hoagland was able to return home on Monday, and we pray that you continue to help him recover from his heart valve surgery. Father, we thank you that Del Brook, after battling infection and low blood pressure in response to the prayers of your people, was able to come home this week as well. And Lord, we pray that you continue now to give recovery to Del and watch over him and Anne. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you've prepared a place for Judy Lowers as she has been able to move now to Royal Meadows. May you bless this new season for her, new friendships, new relationships. Heavenly Father, this week we do pray for Helen Mulder. We pray that even as she goes in tomorrow to have this mass on her ovaries removed, that you would give her on this Easter Sunday a peace that passes understanding, that you would guide her tomorrow morning, that you would guide the hands of the surgeons. And Lord, that as they remove this mass, we pray that every part of that mass would be removed and that you would give her a clean bill of health as we wait for test results. And Lord, that she and Duane and their family could celebrate your goodness. Heavenly Father, even as we pray for Duane and Helen, we pray for John and Carol Westra. Receiving this difficult news this week that his lung cancer of 11 years is back and appears to be inoperable. Father, as he goes in for a PET scan tomorrow, we pray that regardless of whatever that shows, that John and Carol would be reminded that you know them by name, that their lives are held in you, and that nothing can separate us from your love. Heavenly Father, may you, if it's your will, bring a, a miracle of restraining this cancer, and Lord, whatever happens, may you bring a deeper miracle of your peace and your presence. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for Fran Moss as she 
waits now for testing on the results of her chemotherapy. Continue to pray for Ron Holsoff and his family as he battles leukemia. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray with Blake and Tasha Kruger around the bedside of Tasha's father, Randy. We pray that you would continue to give improvement, Lord, that you would spare his life if it's your, if it's your will, Lord, that you would restore even the ability to breathe. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for many in our church who are struggling with mental illness, with loneliness, with deep uncertainty with their businesses or their jobs, with financial struggles. Father, those of us who are struggling with our marriages or relationships with children or one another, Heavenly Father, you know the struggles in our families and in our hearts. And Father, we thank you today that you join us in those struggles and that you have overcome them through your death and resurrection in Jesus. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are walking the road of adoption, that you would walk beside them. We pray also that you'd walk beside those who are grieving in these days. Pray for Rob and Carol Van Voris as they grieve the loss of Carol's sister, Mary Walton. Heavenly Father, we pray for others in our congregation who also are grieving the loss of loved ones. Even on this Easter Sunday, may we be reminded of the wonder that you are the resurrection and the life. So, Father, as we finish this service, hear our prayers, receive our gifts, lead us in this week as your witnesses. May we be bearers of good news. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, as we finish the service, I want to remind you to give, if you're able, for the ministries of the congregation, but also for Christian education. And today we are also taking offering for Bethany Christian Services, the ministries of God's church, of adoption, of the Christian school go on even in this uncertain time. And we invite you, if you're able, to give for those things. Friends, our closing song on this Easter Sunday is I Serve a Risen Savior. We'll sing stanza one and two, receive God's blessing, and then sing stanza three, I Serve a Risen Savior. If you're able, I invite you to, if you haven't been standing, to stand to receive God's parting blessing. Then we'll sing stanza three, and our postlude will be the Hallelujah Chorus. So we go into this day, into this very uncertain time, knowing that He has risen, He's risen indeed. So receive the blessing. Friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you this Easter and always His peace. Amen. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing.